they're ready to go, they want to start, so, and everybody's excited, so let's go. Uh, so this morning we have a special thing, is a le lecture with two speakers, and Mike Silman and Frank Sumfeld are going to give a joint lecture, which I have no title for, but. Okay, so the, the lecture has, the lecture has <laughs> two yeah, <right>. parts. <laughs> so the second part, the last 30 minutes of the lecture, will show you a few functions which Mike uh, wrote while we waited for the pizza to be delivered and while we enjoyed a glass of wine in the bar. So a few functions written by Mike during dinner relevant for the tropics and for discriminants. And I'm going to start out with Macaulay 2 for the rest of us. So I will uh, type these. These are my favorite five commands in Macaulay 2. We're going to see how they work. And Mike will explain what's happening. Okay, so Bernd has just sat down with the keyboard. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I'm not exactly sure what to say about all of this, but Bernd is doing some simple ideal in one variable. So in Macaulay 2, you, you use blackboard bold font. QQ is the rationals, ZZ is the integers, and so on. OK, Mike, I wonder what the Grubner basis would be like of this ideal. <laughs> <laughs> da, da, da. X minus 1. <laughs> OK, so if you ever run any, into anybody who doesn't know what the Euclidean algorithm is, the simplest way to tell them is it just Grosvenor basis in one variable. Okay, so if you meet somebody who wants a definition of the Euclidean algorithm, it's Grosvenor basis in one variable. Okay, so let's try to look at curves in the plane, the x, y plane. The what? Oh, I see. Got it. So each, each ring, by the way, comes with a monomial order. And, and if you don't give it, it's a, the, the default is some graded reverse lexicographic order, which is generally good. So Barrett is overriding that by making it a lexicographic order. OK, let's consider two curves in the plane. The first curve is 2x plus 3y plus 5. And the second curve is x to the 7. No, I'm sorry. 7 times x plus 11 times y plus 13. So I wonder what the Grubner basis will look like. <laughs> ah, y minus 9, x plus 16. If you ever meet anybody who doesn't know what Gaussian elimination is, <laughs> just Grubner basis applied to linear polynomials. Well, let's look at our linear polynomials. I wonder how many intersection points these two curves have in the plane. How many, Baron? <laughs> well, I think, I think we just learned gen GB. Let's try the command degree i, because degree i will calculate the multiplicity, the total number of points. Whoops. <laughs> That always worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a, uh, a, a new feature which will be re uh, fixed uh, soon. <laughs> well, let's try the simpler version. Degree, ideal, lead term with capital T of I. Oh, wow. One point. <laughs> OK, that was a little too easy. So let's take, now we understand Grofner basis generalized Euclidean algorithm and they generalize Gaussian elimination. So now let's try to see whether we can do nonlinear equations in two variables. So let's take our equations and let's make them nonlinear. So let's take the first equation, x squared plus y cubed plus 5. x to the 7 plus y to the 11 plus 13. Gee, 
I wonder, Mike, how many <laughs> intersection points these two <laughs> curves would have in the complex plane. So what do you think? Anyone want to? Now, if I guess? hit return, what will the answer be? Should we offer a valuable prize? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, okay, so who say, who uh, who has a guess? Thirty-three. Let's see. Twenty-two. I'm afraid we have to hold on to the <laughs> yeah, <chart. right. laughs> Okay. Maybe we'll get it at the end. <laughs> 22. Well, we'll, we'll give you more chances. <laughs> there was 22. So this curve of degree 3 and the other curve of degree 11, of course, by Bezu's theorem, meet in 22 points. Right, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> OK, very good. Well, of course, our audience will not believe this until they actually look at the Gerbner basis. Whoops. Can we look at the Gerbner basis? Um, do do, uh, do transpose of that. Transpose. Transpose of o -O. So all of that, the short abbreviation for all of that in Macaulay 2 is OO. -O. Oops. Should we do two string OO? -O? Ah, there's our Grobner basis. What will it tell us? <laughs> OK, so let's see. There are two elements in the Grobner basis. The first one starts y to the 22nd. So there's a degree 22 polynomial in just y. So its roots give us the. Uh, the y coordinates of the solution points. And then the next one is a rather short integer times x, and then the rest is a polynomial in y. So that's giving us uh, x once we know y. So for our 22 points. I can't see it very well. You can't see it very well? I can't see the x. The x. Where is the x? The x is right here. Ah, OK. Ah. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, let's. Wait, oops, wait a oops. second. Emacs for the rest of us. <laughs> okay, so let's look at, you know. Okay, let's change the equations. Let's give our audience another chance. <laughs> let's take Good I. luck. Good luck. <laughs> let's take I to be the. Let's take the same equations. Let's just switch 7 and 11. Let's take x squared plus y cubed plus 5 x to the 11 plus y to the 7th plus 13. And let's count the number of points using degree <laughs> ideal lead term of i. Gee, Mike, I wonder how many points <laughs> these two curves in the plane would intersect in. That's a good question, Bernd. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes? 33. 33. Should we see? Should we see? Or... Hey! Hey, right. wait <laughs> I'm not going to, with all the laptops, I'm not going to win that deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was very nice. Um, let's try another one. The first one was a little hard. So let's. So here we got 22. Maybe you guys want to make another guess. So let me take the same example and replace 11 by 10. So let's. So that was the original one. So I'm going to take i to be the ideal x squared plus y cubed plus 5, x to the 7, plus y to the 10, plus 13. And I'd like to know how many points. So now I have a curve of degree 3 and a curve of degree 10. And they meet in fewer than 30 points. And we will, avail we will award a valuable prize for the first person who guesses how many points these two curves meet in. Should we allow? So everybody is welcome. Faculty, graduate students, mm -hmm. anything goes. <laughs> who, who said? 21. 21. Any others? Suggestion? Who said 18? 18. 21, 18. 
You can't say that those, those t numbers are now taken. <laughs> <laughs> yes? That was going to be my guess. Oh, 20? 20. Okay. Okay, should we try? 21. And the lucky winner is back there. <laughs> Okay, very good. Now that we understand the intersection of two curves in the plane, Mike, shall we move on to surfaces in three-dimensional space? Very, let's move on to surfaces in three-dimensional space. <laughs> okay, so let's make a second polynomial ring. So the old polynomial ring was R. And R is a polynomial ring in X and Y. Now let's make a second polynomial ring, S. Describe it, Mike, what we're doing here. Okay, so I, I think what we're going to be doing is making a parametrized surface. So it's going to be, this is going to be a, a surface in the variables u, v, and w eventually, uh, given parametrized by u is equal to x squared, v is equal to xy, and w is equal to y squared. So this is a ring map. Uh, by the way, in, in Macaulay 2, uh, functions go the right direction. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so this is a map from S to R. Uh, so the polynomial ring S is in U, V, and W. And the kernel of this map is uh, the ideal of the, of the image uh, in, in 3 space. Well, gee, Mike, I wonder what the kernel of this ring map would be <laughs> and what it would mean geometrically. That's a good question. <laughs> so the kernel of this thing is, uh, so it's the same as doing the, the implicitization, of finding the uh, equation of the image <coughs> in three space. OK, let's modify our example, make it a little harder. Everybody sees that the implicit equation of this surface was v squared equals u times w. So I'm going to add on a second term to every polynomial in my parametric representation. <coughs> OK, so now I have a map from the plane into 3 space given by three polynomials of degree 3, 2, and 3. I wonder what the degree of the surface will be. There we go. Good question. But no award for this one. <laughs> okay, so there it is. There is the implicit equation. Oops. Two string crown log f. So there is the implicit equation. It's a polynomial in u, v, and w. It's a uh, Okay, so uh, it, in Emacs it was wrapping through, so I just had it unwrap, and uh, this is still one one equation here. Uh, actually, the print went to set funny because let me actually change the print. Right. So the trouble is, is that when it starts up, it, it has a print went to set, and then when I sort of make the font larger, it, uh, so I don't have any idea how many lines and characters there are. Well, let's say fifty, and now let's do the two string of the kernel of f again, and that's it. Sort wow. of truncated naturally. <laughs> Great, Mike. So Macaulay can easily solve every implicitization problem. Absolutely right? every single one. Okay. <laughs> so that's how we do implicitization. Uh, let's try another example. Let's look at a polynomial ring in six variables, a, b, c, d, e, f. And let's take a 2 by 3 matrix of unknowns. Explain what I'm doing, Mike. Yeah, so, uh, so Bernd is making this 2 by 3 matrix, and whoops, he's taking the ideal generated by 2 in the entries of M, which is probably not exactly what he wants. Um, <laughs> oops. So minors is, uh, needs a. Uh, uh, the size of minors that you're taking. And there it is, it's the, the three two by two minors of this matrix, A, B, C, D, E, F. Ah, okay, very, very nice. 
So uh, I wonder whether this is a prime ideal. And there's one associated prime, and it is, in fact, exactly the original ideal. It's a prime ideal. OK, well, so that's nice. So, so I have this ideal given by three polynomials in six variables. So I wonder what the co-dimension <coughs> of this ideal would be. It's given by three equations, so probably the co-dimension is three. But that's only the case if it's a complete intersection, and oftentimes the co-dimension will be less than that. OK, Maybe so it's not a complete intersection. So I wonder what the degree of this variety would be, or what this variety is geometrically. The two previous lucky winners are encouraged to look at their grand prize. <laughs> so interested in the degree of this toric variety which is the normalized volume of the Toblerone. And the grand prize goes to the person who can answer that That's question. Right. right, Mike? That's right. So who's ready for the grand prize? What's the degree of this ideal for a variety? Anyone want to venture a guess? OK, let's not give it away. Let's leave it for the next problem. Okay? That's right. The answer is 3. Okay. This is a variety. This is the segregated embedding of P1 times P2 and P5. And it has degree 3 and co-dimension 2. Think Toblerone, though. <laughs> OK, very good. Let's take the same equations, but let's get rid of the minus signs. Let's pretend we're in characteristic 2, Mark. <laughs> Define characteristic. <laughs> So this is exactly the same. Whoops, this is supposed to be exactly the same <laughs> as the previous thing, except now we have just pluses. But we are still in characteristic zero. So I wonder what the co-dimension of this ideal would be. Any suggestions? Three. Three. Uh -oh. <laughs> Very good. That's a complete intersection. <laughs> Mike, I wonder whether we should give the grand prize if somebody wants to make a guess what the degree of this variety. Should we actually give the uh, maybe that's too easy. that one's too easy. Okay, eight. Okay, so we have a co-dimension three, complete intersection given by three quadratic equations, which are the two by two <coughs> subterminants of the matrix M. Gee, I wonder whether this is a prime ideal, Mike. <laughs> Let's check it out with decompose. So decompose gives all the minimal primes, or, or all of the uh, the sort of isolated prime ideals of, of this ideal. Oops. Um, OK. So to see it easily, if you do OO slash print, so <coughs> the slash takes a list and sort of does whatever you tell it to do. And there are, in fact, five components. Each one has co-dimension three. Uh, there you have it. That's right. So by Macaulay's unmixedness theorem, a complete intersection has no embedded primes, right, Mike? That's right. So therefore, the intersection of those five prime ideals is our original permanental ideal i. If we could check to make sure by um, typing intersect, uh, what was the list? It was O15. That's the, the list of all five ideals. And so hopefully, this should be the ideal we start with. And, ah. and it is. OK. So. Let's do a last example. I think some of our audience members are actually interested in finite fields. So let's work over a field of characteristic seven in four variables. Here we go. So we have four variables, A, B, C, D. So now we're talking about affine four-dimensional space in characteristic seven. <laughs> okay, the grand prize goes to Doug <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks, Doug. Okay, so now this was the end of the fun part. Now let's get to business. Okay? <laughs> Mike will take over. Okay. So now, these are a few routines that Mike implemented while we waited for pizza in the bar at the Radisson last night. Oh, you have one, right? I have one. Okay.
Okay, let's hit restart again, just to clear off all that stuff. Whoa, this is low. Okay. So now I, I have this set up again in the same way I did last time. So here's the first example. Okay, so this is a polynomial ring in nine variables, x11, x12, <laughs> up to x33. Um, the entries of a three by three matrix of unknowns. <coughs> and this is, this is the matrix. Are you, why don't you? Okay, so the generic matrix makes it, uh, makes a matrix. Uh, the transpose is just there to make the numbers come out like we would normally see them. And now we take the determinant of this, so the minor, the ideal of the three by three minors, which is only one. Ah! Um, Holly has a very convenient output printing facilities. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> now, now the fact is I need to, to get rid of the truncate lines. Okay, so that's the ideal there. We can also, uh, actually, do we do this in here? No. So we can also do the transpose of the generators of I. And there's, oh, well, there's only one. What am I doing? So at any rate, uh, so this is the, the determinant of Okay, so lead is a function that takes an ideal and the arbitrary non-negative integer weight vector and it calculates the leading ideal, the initial ideal, which is generally not a monomial ideal. So this routine here, I think this is all of it. Uh, so what it does first is it sets R to just be the ring, as it says. It makes a new polynomial ring, uh, Q with the same variables as R, the gens of R. And, uh, but now with the new monomial order, which is, a, the giving, which is the weight vector, uh, W. And then it takes the ideal I, that's right on this line here. Uh, it takes the ideal and puts it in this new ring with this new monomial order. It's the same uh, ring except a new monomial order. And then it takes the lead term. Before we were doing lead term with, with just lead term of j, which gives you the monomials. But now lead term of 1 comma j gives you the lead terms with the, respect to the first part of the monomial ordering, which is the weight factor. Anyway, that's the function. And now well, let's use it. Baird, how should we use it? <laughs> well, let's type in and see whether the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 lies in the tropical hypersurface determined by this polynomial. And to remember what the tropical hypersurface is, we have a few handouts from yesterday's lecture. Maybe you can pass them this way. Share with your friends. So I wonder whether the vector 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 lies in the tropical hypersurface where we now take the leading term to be the highest term, right? That's right. So, the, yeah, that's right. So this is a different from what Berndt was doing. So the lead term is the, is the term that, had, that dots as large as possible with this uh, vector of length 9. So here, there's this one gen... Oh, yeah, there's only one generator to this ideal. Uh, because it's the determinant. So it's picking off those terms of maximal size, and there's a bunch of them. Actually, I think there's four of them. Let's see, if I do two string of that, um, this is a small. So actually, pretty much everything is, so there's one term, two terms, three terms, there are four of the six terms. Okay. So we've, for this particular weight vector, the initial form of the 3 by 3 determinant is a subsum consisting of four out of the six terms of the determinant. And therefore, this vector is a point in the tropical hypersurface. So here's another one. Now the initial ideal deletion uh, form is a monomial x13 times x22 times x31. So this ideal is, contains a monomial. So therefore, the vector 0, 0, 1, 0, 3, 1, 1, 1, 0, this particular 3 by 3 matrix, is not 
in the tropical hypersurface of a 3 by 3D term. This means the first matrix is tropically singular, while the second matrix is tropically regular. So a singular 3 by 3 matrix is one that lies on the hypersurface defined by the 3 by 3 determinant, while the second polynomial, the second matrix, is tropically regular. <coughs> it does not lie on the hypersurface defined by the 3 by 3 determinant. Okay, so now we have a new function. So we're interested in whether there's a monomial in this. So this is one way to get this. So what is going on here? Uh, so it takes an ideal J, which we're thinking of as one of these uh, n sub w of i's. Uh, it takes that. V is the product of the generators of the ring, the product of all the ones. How do you tell if a, a, there's a, a monomial inside of this ideal? We haven't talked about saturate, although I will mention it in one of my lectures. Uh, but the saturate is basically finding all polynomials, which when you multiply by some uh, power of v, land you in the ideal j. So if you have a monomial in there, then one will be in this uh, saturation. In fact, it will be if and only if one is That's in right. there. So this monomial phi is, phi is a function that returns either true or false. And so the first one, monomial free, that's the one that had four terms, so hopefully that will return true. True. And the second one had one term, and it returns false. Very good. So we can combine lead and monomial free for a membership test for a point in any tropical variety. So we can take a point W, and we can ask, is W in the tropical variety defined by the ideal I? So then, by running monomial free of lead of the ideal, we will get either true or false. Okay. So now we're looking at the, we're going to be looking, I guess, at the three by, oops. Okay, uh, okay so we're going to look at the three by three minors of a four by four matrix. Okay. So we look, yeah, so now we're looking at, at the condition for a 4x4 four four matrix to have tropical rank at most 2. So a 4x4 four four matrix, say of positive integers, has tropical rank at most 2 if it lies on the tropical hypersurfaces given by all 3x3 three three subdeterminants. So in general, just like in you know, linear algebra, the matrices of rank 2 are characterized as the intersection of all the 3 by 3 subdeterminant hypersurfaces. And there they are. Okay. And now we're doing monomial free of lead of I, where we have now our matrix that we're interested in. Okay, so I wonder what, whether this 4 by 4 matrix has rank at most 2 or not. So we'll now get true or false depending whether this matrix has tropical rank 2 or more. So hit your buzzers if you think. <laughs> okay. False, okay? So let's, uh, let's look at the lead. So that this says that the initial ideal of I with respect to these weights does contain monomials. Okay, here's another matrix. So I take the matrix 2, 3, 17, 19 in the first row. Then the second row is slightly changed. The third row is the tropical sum of the first and the second row. And the last row is the duplicate of the third row. Okay, so I have a 4x4 four four matrix. And in the tropics, so the last two rows are duplicated. And the third row is the sum of the first and the second row. Gee, I wonder, Mike, whether this <laughs> matrix... Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, there you go. True. That button, actually. <laughs> so this matrix has tropical rank at most two, because it has a duplicate row, and one row is the tropical sum of the two other rows. So the answer is true. 
Oops, I don't know why this is example one. We're over here. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, so this is the example from my lecture yesterday, except we homogenized it. So remember in the lecture, we were looking at the intersection of two planes in three-dimensional space. So the first plane uh, was T1 plus T2 plus T3 plus 1, and we drew the tropical hyperplane in red. The second plane was T1 plus T2 plus 2 times T3, and we drew the tropical hyperplane in green. Gee, Mike, I wonder what the intersection of these two tropical planes would be. It's a good question, Barry. So, well, since we don't yet have a connection between Macaulay 2 and G fan, sadly, <laughs> we simply plug in all 0, 1 vectors. So let's just list a few 0, 1 vectors and test whether they are on this you know, intersection or not. So here's the 1100 zero, zero. monomial free. Great, Mike. So we found the first blue point that's in the tropical variety, not just free variety, gotten by intersecting the red stuff with the green stuff. One blue point. Okay. Is this going to be on or not? Failure. Too bad. One zero one one. Hooray! Another blue point has been found. One 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 zero. Shucks. <laughs> <laughs> zero 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 one. Oh, I wonder, are there any other points <laughs> on this intersection of two? <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> so here it is. <laughs> Okay, so that's how we can calculate test membership in the tropical variety defined by an ideal. And that's the end of uh, the Macaulay 2 illustration of my lecture 1. Maybe we should pause for questions. Or other examples you might like to want to see. Or... Well, then let's move. Let's forge forward here. <laughs> so, is it? But let's see. Is this clear? So, what, what's happening? Right. So, okay. Lecture two. So here are some handouts. So uh, this was my lecture two. So now is the beginning of the Macaulay two illustration of my lecture two. Okay, so one of the, the routines that's needed is uh, in computing the discriminant, by the way, Bernd did it. Well, do you want to explain? Or? Yeah, so this is a function called color monomial. So it takes a matrix A, which is uh, an integer matrix, and it makes the list of monomials corresponding to the columns of that matrix in a polynomial ring in unknowns t1, t2, up to td. This, the, the one sneaky thing about this code uh, is that the last line, apply, so it takes the list L, which is all the columns. Mike, why don't you go through every line? I think yeah, that's a good idea. idea. Say what so, they do. OK, first line. Well, first line is we're defining the function column monomials. It has one parameter, which is going to be this matrix of integers A. The second line is we take the transpose of it and take its entries. Uh, entries gives you a list of all the rows. So this gives a list of all the columns of, of the matrix. The next line is, so each matrix has a target and a source, a sort of row space and column space. So this is the number of uh, rows of A, which is the, uh, the number of generators of the target. And now, given that number, we make a polynomial ring over Q with those variables, T1 through Td. And then finally, this, the sneaky part 
it, for each element of L, so that's each column of the matrix A, that's a, I'm using that as an exponent vector. And there's just this uh, sneaky way of getting it. I take a ring T underscore an exponent vector, and it gives me the monomial uh, corresponding to that. So at any rate, that's that function there. <coughs> and here's a, a specific matrix that I, let's see, which one is this? So that's a four by eight matrix, and let's hold it for a second. So if we take the convex hull of these eight column vectors, gee, I wonder what polytope we get. <laughs> okay, Christine, what polytope do we get? What do you get if you take the convex hull of the columns of A? This is a four by eight matrix, and we'd like to look at the columns, the eight column vectors, and we take the convex hull, and uh, it's a polytope, and some chocolates come in this form, and I wonder what that polytope might be. What? Toblerone? A Q, okay? So we're talking about the regular three-dimensional Q. And so, okay, so now we've taken the eight columns, so we've taken the eight homogeneous coordinate vectors of the eight vertices of the regular Q, and we represented them by the corresponding monomials in T1, T2, T3, and T4. And the line between it is, is just a, to break up when it wraps around. Okay. Here are the number of generators of the source, which are eight. So that's the number of uh, columns. And then number of generators of the target is four, four rows. And then here's a new polynomial ring. So this is where the, uh, so to get, to do the discriminant, uh, we have to, uh, make a polynomial uh, xi times each of those monomials. So that's what we're doing now by hand. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we're doing that. So now we have a polynomial ring in 12 variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7, x8, and t1, t2, t3, t4. And the goal is to calculate the A discriminant where A is the three-dimensional cube. So this is making a matrix of all the x's. This is making a matrix of all the T's. Okay, now, what is this line doing? So it's take MA, remember, this thing here is a list of all those monomials. So a matrix of, of a double list is making the matrix of all the monomials, a one by whatever matrix. Unfortunately, it's in the wrong ring. It's in the ring that was just had the T's in it. So this substitute here, all of this stuff here is taking that and substituting it into our new ring with the 12 variables, the t's and the x's. And then we, we multiply it, uh, so that's a row vector, and we multiply it by the column vector, which are the x's, and that gives us the dot product of that. Okay, so now we've made a one by one matrix whose entry is a polynomial in 12 unknowns having eight terms. And this is the family of hypersurfaces given by the three cube. Okay, so we actually want the polynomial, not a, uh, not the matrix. Uh, Macaulay two does all indexing from zero, so the zero zero is the first entry of the matrix. Okay, so if you look at this polynomial, you can see that T four appears as an extraneous factor. So T four <laughs> is an extraneous factor because the last row was this artificial 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 row. So ignore the T4. Then what we have is the general trilinear form. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to make a function that sort of puts all those steps together and then actually computes the discriminant. So here are exactly the lines that we did before, pretty much cut and pasted. So we take the column monomials, 
We take the size of the matrix A, N is the number of columns, D is the number of rows, and then we make the ring R just like we did before. We make the X bears list like we did before, the T bears like we did before. We substitute exactly like we did before, and that gives us a, a matrix, a one by one matrix. Uh, whoops. Um, okay, let's see. Let me make, I'm going to move this over so we can see it all. I'm not sure we can see it all. Ah, here's just a second. It's a convenience, convenient feature of using Macaulay 2 in Emacs for advanced users. <laughs> It usually works great if it wasn't on such a small little thing. Okay, so now anyway, so uh, so th this thing here, let's actually do part of this and, and do this on the next slide. Okay. Now so I'm gee, Mike, I wonder what product flatten entries T bars might mean. Yeah, for instance, I hope I typed all this in right. But anyway, so what happened? Uh, here is, okay, so T bears is that matrix, T1, and so on. Entries gives you that double list of all the entries uh, of, the, of the thing, and flatten makes a single list. So it's going to be, the, the flatten of entries is going to be the list T1 up to TD, which we could have done in other ways as well. And then product is just taking the product of all the T variables. And then the first line is we're taking, we're, the, there's this diff of the T bears, Right here, uh, right there. <laughs> so the diff of t bears comma f is taking the derivative of that polynomial f with respect to all the t1, t2, and so on. And then it's, uh, it's making an ideal of all those. And then it's doing a saturate with respect to the product of the t bears. So in other words, it's doing exactly what we did before, finding all polynomials that are in there. Let's see if we can, and then, if, assuming I haven't messed up here, it's uh, taking, it's going to eliminate from that new ideal, JF is what it's called, it's going to uh, eliminate all of the T variables. And so, so we'll be left with just something in the X variables. And then that's it, it's just going to return that. So it'll return an ideal, and it seems to have given, I hope that actually is really the function, after fussing around with that one thing, we'll find out. Okay, wait a second. So now, Mike, we're calculating the A discriminant, where A is the 4 by 8 matrix representing the three-dimensional cube. We're talking about a general trilinear form, uh, given a 2 by 2 by 2 table. I wonder, Jeremy, what the degree <laughs> of the A discriminant would be. 8. Any other guesses? Should we check it out? Let's check it out whether it's 8. Gee, it's a polynomial of degree 4. I wonder how many terms it has. So if I take the first entry of that uh, ideal 00 and underscore 0, there's the polynomial. <coughs> and if I do size of that, here, let's first of all look at the whole thing. Ah, there is a polynomial of degree 4 in eight unknowns <laughs> having 12 terms. I wonder whether anybody has seen this polynomial before. I don't know, Bear. What do you think? <laughs> Pardon me? It's a hyperdeterminant. It's a determinant of a two by two by two matrix. Gee, I wonder, Bjorn, what the singularities of this hypersurface might be, whether this is a smooth hypersurface. So if we take the determinant of an ordinary, old-fashioned 2 by 2 matrix, we get a smooth projective hypersurface known as the quadratic surface. I wonder whether the 2 by 2 by 2 hyperdeterminant defines a smooth six-fold in P7. Let's check it out. So we have the Jacobi, we take the Jacobian of D, D is the polynomial, uh, or the ideal of that single polynomial. And uh, we take the, that's giving us all the derivatives since it's only one element. And then we're, uh, the trim is actually making it a nicer set of generators. Ah, there's an ideal. What's trim, sorry? Trim, 
takes it, if it takes it, you have an ideal, and it tries to minimize the number of generators. Okay, so Mike, is that the ideal of the singular locus? Yes, this what is the we, ideal of the singular locus. Let's, Sing do, D. let's do co-dimension and degree. So here's the co-dimension. It's co-dimension three. It's co-dimension three. So we take, we're starting with the two by two by two hyperdeterminant. It's a six fold in P7, and the singular locus is a four fold in P7. And its degree is 12. Gee, I wonder, Alicia, whether this is an irreducible variety in P7. <laughs> <laughs> make a guess? Alicia will guess whether or not the singular locus of the 2 by 2 by 2 hyperdeterminant, which is a co-dimension 3 variety of degree 12 and P7, whether or not this is an irreducible variety. So wait, before you answer, why don't we take a look at the generator so you, have a, you can make a more informed guess. <laughs> Oops. So with each line, is, it's been truncated here, but each line is relatively complicated. It looks like each term has one, two, three, four, five terms or something like this. Is this an irreducible variety in P7? Yes or no? Has degree 12 and co-dimension 3? Hint, there are no uh, linear forms uh, dividing it, so you can, can't look for uh, things like the. Okay. Let's try this. Let's try it out, okay? Ah, it is not irreducible. Decompose breaks this variety into... Let's take a look. So I'm taking, oh, 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 I'm sending, making each one a string, and I'm just going <laughs> to uh, print it out, and I get three components. Gee, these are toric ideals, Mike. They're generated by binomials. I wonder what that means. Oops. Okay. So we found that the singular locus of a 2 by 2 by 2 determinant has three components. Each component is a P1 times P3, and it's a gray embedding. So the degree altogether is 12. And it corresponds to the three flattenings of the 2 by 2 by 2 tensor. So a, three, a 2 by 2 by 2 tensor, 3 qubits, can be written in three different ways as a 2 by 4 matrix. So then we take the 2 by 2 minus of that, which is a uh, four-dimensional Toblerone, and there are three copies of that. We take the union, the reduced union, and that's the single locus. Let's move on to the next example, Mike. Oops. OK, this is the Sylvester resultant. So there's the one from your top, I think, right? You mm -hmm. in your top. <laughs> okay, now let's just calculate the discriminant of this. Okay, and now let's see how many monomials there are in there. There are seven monomials. Okay, so there's a polynomial of degree four and six unknowns having seven monomials. So let's take a look at its singular. Gee, I wonder what the singular locus of the resultant of two binary quadrics might be. We have two polynomials of degree 2 in one variable. We're interested in the hypersurface, that the condition for them to have a common root. I wonder what the singular locus might be. It's co-dimension 2. Aha, it has co-dimension 2, not co-dimension 3, as in the previous example. Degree is three. And the generators, whoops. It's there are six generators. Uh, x3, x5 squared, and so on. There's a little bit of a mess here. Aha. Uh -huh. So we have a subscheme of projective five space of degree three and co-dimension two. I wonder whether this subscheme is reduced and irreducible. Let's check it out <laughs> with primary decomposition. Oops. It looks like there are two components. This uh, since that gives two, and we can like we can display it out this way. Aha! Uh -huh. So we have two components. There's a co-dimension two associated prime. There's a co-dimension two primary ideal. That's a prime, and there's a co-dimension three. The first one, the co-dimension 2, 
looks like the toric variety of some three-dimensional polytope. Gee, Mike, I wonder what that polytope is that's represented by the first ideal. What is it then? <laughs> Anybody seen these three equations and six unknowns before? We're done with that. So the first ideal, 2 by 2 minus, gee, I wonder what the polytope is that goes with this ideal. Hint, we don't have any more to hand out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The second ideal, so this is the Toblerone. Okay, there's again. So this Sylvester result is singular across P, along P1 times P2. But interestingly, there's an embedded component of co-dimension 3. Okay, let's wrap it up. So do you have one more example, maybe? Um, let's see. We have the horn uniformization. Maybe, maybe well, let's do the A. So this is the example we did with uh, the, in my group okay. last, and let's do the horn uniformization on uh, maybe tomorrow in my okay. lecture, after my lecture. Okay. So this is an, an example of a certain. Let's go slowly. We'll be done in thirty seconds. So this is a certain four by eight matrix that my group struggled with last night. We discussed. You know, actually, in, that's in not the evening. Is that the one? No. This is the nasty one. Oh, the nasty one. Do you have the one I gave you? The one you gave me is this one here. Let's do that one. Um, the trouble is I need uh, the horn uniformization to do it. Uh-huh, okay. So let me just, uh, we, we'll show you this to you later, but here I'm just going to write that in. Okay, okay. let's go back and look at A. So horn is a certain function that eats a matrix A and produces what, Mike? Uh, it produces. Let's uh, show it. <laughs> it produces a ring map, which is the, uh, which is a parametrization of this discriminant. So let's try it. Let's do horn of A. And uh, let's see. Let's transpose the, uh, the, the. This is a ring map from R X, which <laughs> is uh, some ring having all of these variables in it, uh, mapping to R, which is. Wait, what are the rings? So generators of R are all the C's and T's, and the generators of Rx are just the X variables. So the kernel of this map is going to be, hopefully, the A discriminant. That's right. So I have a ring map from polynomial ring in eight unknowns X1 up to X8 to another polynomial ring in eight unknowns C1, C4 up to uh, T1 up to T4, and we calculate the kernel. And kernel, as you remember, is a command that will solve easily every implicitization problem in Macaulay 2, right? Okay, let's go. <laughs> so, um, so it actually does do this one, I think. Um, okay, so maybe while this uh, calculates the A discriminant for this example, this is the end. So the pizza got delivered, and we had no more time for further programming. They didn't have dessert, so maybe we'll take questions now while this computes. It seems that when you were defining the singular locus of these discriminants of the order locus, I don't even know which is the one they were anymore, um, that you did you put the, uh, the equation itself in the ideal. Was that not necessary, or was, did I miss that? Uh, that was a homogeneous equation. Oh, right. So it's yeah. already in the ideal of the partial. So it's already is it about Euler's relation or something? Yeah. But this is one of the biggest. This is one of the common mistakes in Macaulay too. Is for higher dimensions to forget to, to put that in. And I've had people uh, come to me and say, you know, something's really messed up with your program because you're getting the wrong thing. But in fact, it's always uh, this happened to me at least four times. Okay. So the A discriminant that my which my group discussed last night. It is a polynomial of degree 14. Gee, Mike, I wonder how many terms it has. Um, okay. Let's see. So let's actually calculate. Here's the polynomial. Oh, that was a yeah. mistake. So size of that is, is a polynomial with 168 terms in eight unknowns of degree 14. It has some interesting coefficients. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, thanks for your attention. Thanks. Okay.